Hi everybody, long time no see. Thank you for tuning in to this week's video. If you've been following the zoo on social media, in addition to all of our fun posts announcing our newest arrival, you might have noticed that we've been talking about prehistoric animals and paleontology across all of our platforms. For those of you who have not met me, I am Educator Emily, and in this video we'll be talking about how we interpret paleontological data and bring it to life. We're talking about the lovely, wonderful world of paleo art. Now, what is paleo art? So, paleo art is an art genre that uses fossil evidence to bring the past to life. Paleo art directly shapes how we think of deep time and prehistoric life. Paleo art includes the artistic renderings of dinosaurs, as well as other prehistoric extinct life forms, like plants bacteria, fungi, and landscapes of the past. Paleo art is far from being a stagnant field. In fact, it is always changing as more and more paleontological data comes to light. Paleo art can also change depending on the global climate at the time in which the art was produced. In this video, we're going to be looking at paleo art throughout time and how it's changed as we've learned more about prehistory. Thus, we're going to learn about how our perceptions of dinosaurs and prehistoric life has changed, starting in the 1800s and going all the way up to today. Now, before we talk about what is considered the first pictorial piece of true paleo art, I do want to say that before this piece was released, people had been creating paleo art for decades. However, the first piece based on true fossil evidence was created by Sir Henry Thomas de la Biche in 1830 based on the fossils found by British paleontologist Mary Anning, who deserves her own video because she's awesome and amazing and great. With it being the 1800s and all, and sexism, and especially sexism in science running rampant, it was extremely difficult for Anning to get funding as a woman in paleontology. It was also incredibly difficult for her to get recognition for her work. So, De La Beche, a longtime family friend of the Annings, sold copies of his work to raise money for her endeavors. Like many early works of paleo art, Doria Antiquor, or Ancient Dorset, depicts animals in continuous acts of violence. In the foreground, we have an ichthyosaur killing a plesiosaur, and below that, we have another ichthyosaur hunting a fish. We see another plesiosaur sneaking up on a crocodile on the shore, and in the background, we see another one hunting a pterosaur and bringing it down into the sea. In the sky, we see two pterosaurs flying as if they are in combat or about to be in combat with one another. Dinosaurs were thought of at this point in time to be solely terrifying, bloodthirsty beasts always locked in combat combat with one another. And while we know that no modern animal is consistently locked in war with other animals in its environment, and thus can probably infer that prehistoric animals behaved similarly, that did not stop paleo artists from depicting dinosaurs as bloodthirsty, dangerous, terrifying beasts. These violent depictions heavily influenced the public perception of these animals, and still does to this day. Also in the 1800s, in the 1850s, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins commissioned a series of sculptures under the eye of Sir Richard Owen, who was a prominent biologist and paleontologist of the time. Knowing what we know today, the Crystal Palace sculptures are wildly inaccurate. However, despite being inaccurate, these pieces hold immense scientific and historical significance because they represent what the scientific community and thus the public really thought of dinosaurs at that time. And at that time, people thought dinosaurs were sluggish, lazy versions of modern day reptiles. As the 1800s progressed and more and more people began to consume paleo art, whether that was through pictorial or sculptural presentations, it continued to not only be influenced by the available paleontological data of the time, but also by the global culture and the beliefs of the people who were painting these pieces of art. The animals depicted in Adolphe Francois Panama Maker's piece, The Primitive World, in 1857, are heavily influenced by mythological and biblical beliefs. Earth is depicted as fiery and hellish, and many of the animals depicted in the painting resemble dragons or other mythological beasts and demons. The work The Ichthyosaur and the Plesiosaur by Edward Rio depicts two iconic animals of the 1800s, the Ichthyosaur and the Plesiosaur, in combat with one another. Despite them living in very different times of the Mesozoic 
Dog era. These reptiles were often depicted as bitter enemies, constantly at war with each other on the high seas, serving as perfect allegories for the naval conflicts happening in Europe at the time. After the 1800s, we begin to enter the period of what is known as classical paleo art. which is probably what most of us are familiar with, or at least where we begin to become familiar with paleo art. The artist Charles R. Knight is considered to be one of the most iconic artists of this period. Though legally blind in one eye and painting many of his pieces inches from the canvas, he created some of the most influential and iconic pieces of paleo art, including his most well-known pieces at the American Museum of Natural History and the Field Museum. Because much of his paleo art was and is still displayed in heavily trafficked and well-renowned museums throughout the country, Knight helped to shape and continues to shape the public and cultural perception of prehistoric animals. One of Knight's iconic pieces, Leaping Laylaps, painted in 1897, is a piece that was made for the American Museum of Natural History. This piece of artwork was way ahead of its time, depicting dinosaurs as agile and active animals. This painting is currently in the American Museum of Natural History's collection. Another one of Knight's iconic pieces is on display at the Field Museum in Chicago, in their Hall of Fossil Vertebrae. This piece depicts a triceratops and a T-Rex, and inspired effects artists for the movies of The Lost World in 1925 and Fantasia in 1940. Unlike Leaping Laylaps, this piece of artwork reflected the current view of dinosaurs at the time. They were viewed as sluggish, giant reptiles that were evolutionary failures. They were seen as being far from agile, which is why in this artwork we see the dinosaur in the back using its tail as a third limb for balance, which is known as the tripod position, and the tail of the triceratops dragging on the ground. We now know today that theropod dinosaurs, like T-Rex, held their tail and whole body parallel to the ground, and ceratopsids, like Triceratops, would have also had an elevated tail. Knight died in 1953, and while some of his works may not reflect modern paleontological views, they continue to be viewed by millions of people every year, both online and in museums across the country. After the era of classical paleo art, we begin to enter what is known as the dinosaur renaissance. This renaissance occurred in 1964, after paleontologist John Ostrom discovered the skeleton of Deinonychus, which he found right here in Montana, might I add, near Bridger. His description of this dinosaur, published in 1969, challenged the old view of what people thought dinosaurs were. The discovery of Deinonychus revealed that dinosaurs were bird-like, not only in anatomy, but probably in behavior as well. However, this was not the first time this connection had been made. In fact, biologist Thomas Huxley made the connection in the 1800s, after the discovery of Archaeopteryx. But his theory was not well received by the scientific and public community. It took Ostrom's evidence from Deinonychus to solidify Huxley's argument and kickstart the dinosaur renaissance. The dinosaur renaissance took place from roughly 1970 to 2010 and featured artists such as the paleontologist Robert Backer, who brought Deinonychus to life, Gregory S. Paul, John Gersh, and E.Y. Kish, who was one of the few female artists in the field at the time. Their works depicted dinosaurs as agile, warm-blooded, social, intelligent beings. These depictions highly contrasted the way dinosaurs were portrayed in classical paleo art. In addition to changing how these animals were displayed in pictorial paleo art, the influence of these artists spread to museum displays, where they actually changed the anatomical structure of many of the specimens in those museums to reflect the current views. It was also in this era of paleo art history that dinosaurs began to be depicted with feathers for the first time, as scientists continued to further the connection between avian dinosaurs and birds. However, the peak of this movement is probably most prominently marked by the novel and movie Jurassic Park in the 1990s. Not only were many of the paleo artists and paleontologists of the dinosaur renaissance on the consulting team for the movie, but the franchise reignited and continues to reignite the public's interest and fascination with these animals, despite there being many inaccuracies in the movie that continue to be revealed as more paleontological data comes to light. The movies truly made dinosaurs and paleo art accessible to everyone. Now, 
Now, the modern era of paleo art is marked by a digital world, with open access to resources, easy collaboration between enthusiasts and paleo artists, and high-speed data of modern paleontology. This current era is also marked by paleo artists continuing to push the artistic envelope in order to try and avoid falling into cliches of past paleo art history periods. One of these concepts, which was present a little bit in the dinosaur renaissance, is the concept of shrink wrapping. Aside from hard fossilized evidence like bone, teeth, and plates, much of paleo art is speculative. Most of the time, how paleo artists choose to color their dinosaurs and make all of the soft tissue is up to the artist's discretion. As a result, it's difficult to know what many prehistoric animals actually looked like, which has prompted some artists to embrace the concept of shrink wrapping, which is drawing animals as if they were just skin draped over bone. As more evidence comes to light that avian dinosaurs were likely covered in a thick coat of feathers from head to tail, like Deinonychus or Velociraptor, they begin to look nothing like their partially shrink wrapped counterparts that we see in the paleo art of the dinosaur renaissance and Jurassic Park. While shrink wrapping can help avoid the inaccuracies that come with drawing soft tissue, such as scales, feathers, body ornaments, and other coverings, it also creates a whole new realm of inaccuracies. For example, drawing modern animals under the concept of shrink wrapping creates animals that look nothing like their real life counterparts. And thus, as consumers of paleo art, or even paleo artists ourselves, we have to ask how reliable is this shrink wrapping method? The only way to know for sure is to watch how paleo art and paleontology progress. And that wraps up our video on paleo art. Thank you guys for so much for tuning in and hopefully after this busy summer season, we'll be able to be getting back to posting more regularly on YouTube. Until then, we are still active on all of our other social media platforms on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So make sure to give us a follow there. We are announcing some very cool and exciting information, not only about paleontology, but about some of our newest animal arrivals. Until then, get out in the sunshine, wear your masks, and stay safe. Bye, everybody.